Friends, this is Dolores Williams of DW's View. Stand up. If we do not stand up for what is right, who will? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to DW's View. Stand up. Today, to my audience, I want to thank you for coming each week and listening to this podcast. I don't take your time for granted. And today, I have the privilege of introducing a very special guest. Miss Penny Harrington. And Penny lives right here in, in San Diego County. She serves as a public policy analyst, assisting several conservative organizations in tracking legislation and related issues. Penny is married to her husband for 42 years, and I'm just looking forward to you meeting Penny. Please help me welcome my guest today, Miss Penny Harrington. Good morning, Penny. How are you today? Good morning, Dolores. I'm well. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Yes, yes. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'll go ahead and ask you first question. Penny, how did you get involved with tracking legislation? And also tell us about Penny's fix and, and how you distribute that. Well, they are two very separate topics, but related in that they both have to do with uh, government. First of all, I, I became involved and interested in legislation after I left my banking career to stay at home with our sons. And there's nothing like becoming a parent to have you start looking at the world around you and realizing, oh my goodness, what's happening and what's the world gonna be like that they're growing up in. So we had two young sons and we were getting involved in a small church and I started listening to a lot of talk radio. And kind of that was my first interest in what was happening and how the world was relating or not relating to my biblical values. So I happened to go to a community impact seminar that Focus on the Family was hosting in San Diego. I went with my pastor's wife and it was like um, an Ezekiel watchman on the wall calling that came to me as a mom. It wasn't really related to my banking career, uh, but it, it encouraged me to talk to my pastor about starting to share with our congregation what was happening in state legislation and national legislation. And that launched a uh, newsletter that I did for our church. We would do announcements about pending legislation. And then um, several years later, a friend of mine who was with Concerned Women for America contacted me and they needed someone to track legislation for CWA of California. And I joined the steering committee after much prayer uh, be careful when you pray the prayer of Jabez to expand your territory because that territory got enlarged in that way. So that led to about 13 years worth of being uh, uh, the uh, director of legislation for Concerned Women for America of California and letting our constituents know about what was happening with bills. And now I'm into a little bit of a new season and just doing some work and analysis for several different organizations. And it's, you kind of can't not do what you're called to do. So I just keep doing it. It's, it's, a, it's a joy to me. I love encouraging people to take part in the process and the privilege that we have of citizens, as citizens to not only vote, but, and vote biblically, but also take part and take that a step further to communicate with our officials what we desire for them to do to represent our values in the state capital and the federal capital as well. Yeah, thank you. That, that is wonderful. Now, Penny's Picks, is that, now, the, how far and why do you distribute that? Those are a, a separate uh, topic. Um, it hasn't, doesn't have to do with legislation, but it has to yeah. do with recommendations for voting. And I do a lot of analysis into what the candidates stand for, um, who they are, who's endorsed them. And you know there are no perfect candidates out there, but we try to do the best we can to recommend people who uh, would support our values in office. And that is just for San Diego County. I would yeah. love to um, expand that and train other people to do it in other counties. There are people in Orange County doing it as well. 
um, robinnordell.com. Robin Nordell does picks and posts a lot of other people in that area who do them, but it's a good resource um, for people to go mm -hmm. to, to just be able to find out an opinion, just a recommendation of who might be good choices for them and then do their own research. And I always encourage people to research, research, research um, the election. So. Yeah, yeah, well, that's great. Well, I'm thankful that you're able to come and talk about legislation today. Now, I have several bills and, and I just want to share with the audience. I'm thankful for the list that you provided of bills that are the things that are happening in California that don't just affect California. And the first bill that I want to uh, have you discuss with us is AB 1084. Now, that was sponsored by Democrat Lowe here in, in California. And this is the LGP, LGBT bill. And uh, this one requires the creation of a gender neutral department for childcare items in stores. And uh, I just have you expound on that a little bit, tell our audience what that's yeah. about. Right, thank you. Um, yes, this is a, a bill that was actually sponsored by an organization called the Fluid Project, PHL Fluid Project. And um, I'll just tell you what they say is it supports, pop, they support policies that empower consumers while creating safe and affirming spaces. What happens with this is, and there's actually a little good news on this. What happens when a lot of these bills go through the committee process? is the authors of the bills, and in this case, someone um, who is, is very much um, a, a very far left um, Democrat, actually listens. This is Evan Lowe from the Bay Area, and he had a lot of opposition um, in going into the committee process and actually amended the bill to be not as bad as it was initially. So that's something that our elected representatives can help do. Um, even when some of these bills pass, they won't be perhaps as bad in some cases. Originally, this bill was going to force larger retailers, think Target, Kohl's, anything, anybody with 500 or more employees, it was going to force them to have to take away the boys section and the girls section in clothing and toys and everything and have everything just gender neutral, just kind of mix it all up and have no, no boundaries and kind of make it confusing for parents. You know, I'm trying to look for this particular thing. Well, that has been amended back, which is a good thing to, but still requiring these retailers to set up a separate gender neutral area. I don't even know what exactly is gonna be in those areas, but it'll be clothing and toys <laughs> and baby supplies and things like that, that have no gender. Um, so it, it's just, I, I understand their, their point is they want to affirm people who are confused about their sexuality. Um, and of course, in California, we now over the past few years now only have, we have male, female and non-binary classifications, even for driver's licenses and things. Um, but, you know, it forces retailers to have to change what they do. And when people go into a retailer, they know what they're looking for and they should be able to find it without having to force them to do these types of things. Mm -hmm. So th this bill is um, in the process. It's in appropriations right now. We're right at the, sec at the portion of our legislative session where um, bills that are gonna require any state money to actually put them into effect are waiting to find out if there's enough money in the budget to actually make the bills come to pass. So they're being held generally in a suspense file and appropriations until the budget is determined. And then they'll get moved out to the floor if they pass out of appropriations. And we're right there now. Everything has to be out of their house of origin and then move over to the second house by June 4th. So it's coming to down to the wire. And so it's important that people call with their opinions on these bills now, because these bills are gonna be hitting the floor of their first house very soon. And then it goes over, you know, rinse and repeat in the next house uh, after that, through the whole committee process all over again. My goodness, I'm, I'm just amazed that that bill would even be passed. <laughs> 
it's, well it you know it, yeah, i know it's, it's likely it's likely yeah. that it will but if you know if enough retailers say this is look it's making it harder for us to have to do this type of thing it it may not but the good news is it was reduced in its scope and that has happened with a number of bills which is good news it's good news it's a it, we can consider these small wins victories because it's hard when you're in the minority in a state like this yeah. yeah it sure is it sure is now the next uh bill that i would love for you to talk about is sb2 now this one um religious freedoms and speech that's mm -hmm. what this particular bill is about um, and this relates to law enforcement um, there are certainly a, my, a very, very small minority of members of law enforcement who maybe shouldn't be in that profession. Maybe they do legitimately have bias or some type of discriminatory attitude toward people of whatever race or, you know, et cetera. We've seen a lot of this in the media, of course. And there are, there are bad apples in every single profession across the planet. People, you know, have a sin nature and some of us maybe shouldn't be doing what we're doing. But the problem with SB2 and a, a prior bill, which we had another victory on because there was one predecessor to this, AB655 on the assembly side, that actually the, the language that groups like Alliance Defending Freedom, wonderful legal, Christian legal organization were concerned about, they actually brought up um, uh, an opposition to that bill and that language was removed. Now this one is similar and we're hoping that some of this language will be removed as well before it hits the floor or maybe in the second house. So what happens with this one is um, it requires, um, I want to try to read you the actual language of it, um, but it does actually pose an issue to, potential issue to uh, police officers who are people of faith, who could be determined with vague language, but if they hold opinions of biblical worldview, and folks maybe who are over them in the police department don't appreciate those views. And for example, an officer does a podcast like you're doing, or he, he or she puts something on Facebook or leads a Bible study like Kelvin Cochran did, a police chief in, in Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, and he was fired because mm -hmm. he did a Bible study that happened to mention the importance of male female marriage and you know that's normal for us in the faith and so but it would allow them if these if these are considered acts of bias by their supervisors it would allow an application to be denied or it would be grounds for terminating that law enforcement officer now it's going to be up to the departments how that's weeded out. And there are maybe some good things in this bill, but the point is we wanna take those things out. So what legal groups will often do is say, we oppose this unless it's amended. And a lot of times that will put enough pressure for the author to say, okay, I get it. Like what happened with AB 655 and say, okay, I'll take that out. And then, you know, then we're not opposed to it because there are some good things in the bill. So, um, but at this point, I would ask my state senator to oppose SB2. I would ask my assembly member to oppose AB 1084. And that's the reason we're bringing these up. This is what we, we encourage people to do is to take part in the process. And they don't hear, our lawmakers don't hear a lot from us. When they get a few, when they get 50 calls in a day, that's a big deal from their district. So it's important that we really make our voices heard. Yeah, well, that's that's good, and and I think we need to do a better job of getting that word out to every citizen mm -hmm. to call and make your voice heard, and and uh, we certainly will be in prayer for our police officers. They have enough to deal with. Absolutely. Well, and we know that because of all that's going on, they're retiring early. Yeah. People aren't signing up. 
as much. So God bless them. We need them. I we know them. we need them. And, but you know, you can't even blame them. No, uh, absolutely blame them not. You can't. You can't. Yep. Yeah, well, well, thank you for that. Uh, now, SB 57, that's another bill that's coming up. And that one is about drugs and establishing overdose overdose uh, prevention programs with safe location sites. I, I was just amazing when I when I read the background on that, but I'll let you share with us about that. Well, again, this this is um, this particular bill is um, specific to the city and county of San Francisco, the county of Los Angeles, and the city of Oakland. So, at right now, this is what happens a lot of times. They'll start as kind of a pilot project and then expand if it goes well in their determination. So. Um, Right now, our law prohibits that your ability to dispense controlled substances to addicted people, and it has to be only in certain manner that can they be dispersed. And this is going to allow entities within these areas, these jurisdictions, to um, have hygienic spaces supervised where people can basically come and shoot up or whatever they're doing with mm -hmm. these substances and they'll be monitored for overdose and all of that but we find in the it's interesting when you look at the support and opposition of all of these um these uh, bills that are being brought up opposed to this are groups like alliance to protect children all the law enforcement state sheriff's association peace officers association um, individuals, California Family Council, Narcotics Officers Association, they're saying that this is really not a safe way. It may sound good because we're providing a mm. sterile environment for this, but mm. even Governor Brown vetoed something similar to this a few years ago. So it doesn't make a pathway to treatment. It's just like, you know, come in and leave. It, it's, and it keeps it doesn't do anything to keep to break the cycle. So um, we would be opposed to this and encourage people to just say no. Ask your, um, this is by Scott Wiener, who's from the San Francisco area, mm -hmm. and, and encourage people to, you know, really actually, if they're going to set up something like this, make sure that it continues and that we help break the chain that binds these people to these addictions and not just a place for them to come and do drugs safely if there's yeah if that can even be done if that's even how, how do you do possible. a drug safely I, it's, it's like, as i was saying it i thought that doesn't make <laughs> oh my god <laughs> The things that people do them cleanly up. or some <laughs> sterilely. I don't, I, you know. Yeah. Well, the next one we want to talk, I want to ask you to speak about is SB 217. Now, that one is on education. And I know this one started with that California Healthy Youth Act. Oh, yeah. Well, you know about that one. Well, this is one that we really can uh, claim as a, as a victory and pray and make our voices heard that it continues. Um, it, it's not as large a victory as we would like. The Healthy Youth Act was passed a few years ago and has really changed the scope of sex yeah. education in our California public schools. And it even forced charter schools to start um, doing sex education there as well, according to their stipulations. So it has to be broad and all sexual orientations and it needs to include this, that, and the other thing that we probably won't mm. talk about right now. Um, but, it, and it requires that um, sex education be taught once in middle school, once in high school, but it can also be taught down as far as kindergarten. <laughs> and it depends on the school district, what they're going to do. And it's really been, it was pushed by Planned Parenthood. It was pushed by the teachers union, which of course Planned Parenthood teachers union are always working hand in glove. Um, and it's really been a, a terrible thing for our kids. Um, it, some school districts may handle it well, um, but unless parents really look very carefully at the curriculum, 
they don't know. There's no way for them to know. And it's hard for parents to take time off work and go yeah. and look through all the curriculum. Some schools are make it very difficult to, for parents to do that. So what SB 217 has happened, um, Brian Dolly, Senator Brian Dolly, has proposed that the curriculum simply be put online on the either a parent portal or on the district's actual website. So parents can look at everything, the entire curriculum and the ancillary materials, information about any outside speakers who are coming, just create transparency. And last year, the, um, the chair of the Senate Education Committee, Connie Leva, actually said she was all for transparency. So Brian Dolly brought this bill forward this year and um, said, okay, here it is, transparency. Well, it failed its first go round in the Senate Education mm -hmm. Committee. It had a translation requirement in it. And apparently that was a sticking point whether that's completely what the sticking point was or not, we're not sure, but um, he, that was removed. It was brought back to the committee on reconsideration. And we hardly ever see bills actually go back for reconsideration in a committee, but it did and it passed. And that was just mm -hmm. huge. It was huge. And one really interesting outcome from this whole COVID thing was that, they set up a system where individuals could actually call into these hearings and provide what we call me too's. And that means that you can actually call in and you can say your, your name, where you're calling from, and that you support or oppose a particular bill. You individually, you can actually talk to the committee and say, I support this bill. Whereas you'd have to travel to Sacramento to, to do that under normal circumstances. So I hope that continues even when we open up but there were so many Me Too's, they finally had to just stop it on our side. There were people who just couldn't get through. So that this is really a great victory, but it's not a victory until it actually passes and becomes law. So this needs to get out of Appropriations Committee. It needs to pass the floor of the Senate and then go through the process all through again on the assembly side. So we need to keep praying for this bill and Senator Dolly, we need to be calling in and asking right now, ask your state Senator to support SB 217 when that comes to the floor. And we certainly pray that it does. We need it out of appropriations committee. So if your Senator is on that committee, call. But um, it, this, is a, this is a real, true victory to see this coming. It sounds small, but any victory for us in Sacramento is a big thing. It's a big deal. Yes, it is. And you know, I, I would pray that parents would find out because I think parents who care about their children want to know what's happening. And if we could get this message out to parents, please call, then that would overwhelm the system. And I'm, I do agree with being able to call in as, you know, I've been able to call in and apply and oppose or support some bills right. and, it's, and it's great because like you say all of us can't make it to Sacramento but yeah I hope well, parents can get the information yeah it's very important and you know I would advise parents in probably most cases to opt their children out um, yeah. there was there's no ability it's not an opt-in situation you have to opt your child out of the public school sex education and you know I if they don't have time to review it, I would say opt out and teach your child your values at home during that time instead. Yeah, and I, I hope that they would actually be able to opt out. How would, would they remove them from the class or how would yes, that there, work? Yes, there, there is a requirement under the Healthy Youth Act that allows parents to opt their children out. So mm -hmm. it should be a simple process at the school, but the parent has to be aware of when the class is going to be taught. They're given information at the beginning of the school year um, that they have the right, but they have to be proactive about exercising that right and opting their child out. Yeah, yeah, a lot of parents are opting out of public school period. I was- That's another goodness. issue entirely. <laughs> you know, Penny, I was listening yesterday uh, to some parents who were irate and rightfully so at some of the legislation and some of the things that are being taught. I mean, X-rated stuff that makes a grown man lose his hair on his head. It was like, whoa. Yeah. 
it was horrendous, but yeah. Yeah, yes, we definitely, definitely are not just sex education, as you say, it's beyond well yeah. beyond that through throughout the curriculum. And it's changing yeah. rapidly. It's changing rapidly in California yeah. and other states. Well, thank you for that one. Um, SB 245. Now that one is about abortion. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So <laughs> free abortions. I'll let you share. Pretty that. much, yes. You know, sometimes you think there's just nothing more they can possibly do to make abortion services more accessible in California. We have literally no restrictions on abortion at any mm. stage of gestation even, because even late term abortions, if you have a, a mental health reason, any kind of anything that comes under health reason, um, you can have a late term abortion in California at taxpayer expense. In California, our, our taxes are used for Medi-Cal abortions. And we're probably one of the freest states, if not the most free in terms of the, access, the accessibility of abortion. And now um, this will even prohibit um, a woman from Ha even have being able to pay or having to pay a deductible or a $20 copay or whatever for an abortion. And of course, there they, she can go to Planned Parenthood and get one free. Um, Medi-Cal is basically free, but this is just finding another niche where they can, again, expand it. And the, the, the cheaper it is, and free is pretty cheap, the cheaper it is, um, the more likely they are to say a woman is to say, okay, it's not going to cost me anything. I can just do it as, as if a $20 copay were really going to be prohibitive for someone, but it's just another step. Um, there can't be any coinsurance, any copay, any deductible for abortion services. And again, it's passed. It probably yeah, will that pass. Is it's, yeah. I, I, that's just evil. It's yeah. just pure evil, the abortion issue. You know, I was listening to Javier Becerra on an interview yesterday. I don't know if you saw him. They were asking him about uh, abortion and actually uh, where they actually killed this baby, a partial birth abortion. Mm -hmm. And he tried to pretend he did. There was no law, on nothing, you know, for that. And I said, wait a minute, this is a guy who went after the little sisters of the poor and tried to force them, nuns, to pay for abortions or, or for women to have have that ability to have not, they don't, they're not going to have abortions, but why would nuns have to pay for that service or pay to even have that available? And and then I, you know, I always every chance I could bring up this young man, David Delight, and who took on Planned Parenthood, who's fighting in court right to this day, because he exposed Planned Parenthood and what they were doing was selling mm -hmm. aborted baby parts. And uh, so it, it's just horrendous. And, and I try to bring that up every chance because sometimes, you know, Penny, stuff is so ridiculous that people don't even believe that it's happening. Yeah. But, but but it's just real and, and, and we have to just tell the truth about it and not hide it because people need to know these kind of things are happening. Yep. Now, yep. Yeah, now the next bill, SB 380, is about assisted suicide. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm not really sure about that one. We're on the other side of life here. And of course, our belief is that God determines when life begins and when it ends, and it's sacred during that whole spectrum of time. Well, as we know, assisted suicide has been the law here in California for several years now. It was due to sunset in, I believe, 2023. Um, SB 380 is a bill that removes that sunset. It will just allow assisted physician-assisted suicide to continue, and um, it will it will also shorten the window of, there used to be a 15 day window between when you could receive your um, uh, initial discussion with the doctor and actually get the prescription and now it will be two days. So it's, it's that cooling off period that's gonna be shortened 
and not allow people to really think about this decision as long. And But even in this case, here's another bill that had another stipulation in it that would have required a physician that did not want to participate in assisted suicide to refer a patient to a doctor who would. And there was a conscience, a very large conscience issue saying, oh, sure, I'll refer you. When that, when that doctor says, I don't, you know, I don't think this is the best thing for you. We have palliative care, et cetera, whatever that doctor's beliefs are to force that doctor to send someone to another physician, that was removed. Mm. Um, it came real close to that whole, when you mentioned Javier Becerra, he was our attorney general when, we, when that NIFLA case came up where there was a bill that was gonna force um, pregnancy medical clinics, pro-life clinics to refer patients to abortion. Mm -hmm. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. That's forced speech. That's exactly what this was going to be doing. It was going to be forcing a doctor to refer a patient to a physician that would give them a prescription to kill themselves. So um, that was removed. And I think maybe that somebody started thinking about the whole NIFLA case in, in relation to SB 380. So that was removed. Then there was another part of the original bill that would have allowed social workers to be considered mental health professionals for mental health visits. Now, I must say one of the worst things about the physician assisted suicide law in California is that there is no requirement for a mental health visit to determine that you maybe you just need to talk to somebody about your problems. Um, and there's no requirement unless the physician that's being asked to provide the medication refers someone. Well, this would have, what if they did refer, it would have allowed them to go to a social worker who doesn't have the expertise for this situation. That was removed. So we had two small wins in the midst of this bill. So a bit of a victory, but it's still a no. It's still a call your senator and ask them to oppose SB 380. Keep the sunset. Let's look at this bill again before it's supposed to come to its end and then see if it can, we can fix some things in it or maybe make it go away entirely and make this state a life affirming state. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so the next bill, um, Penny, SB 519, this one, it, again, we're back on drugs. <laughs> not us, but- <laughs> well, not us, not right now. <laughs> Yes, this one, this one actually decriminalizes. It's it, um, it's by Anthony Weiner, another of his bills from up in the San Francisco area. Mm. It decriminalizes LSD, magic mushrooms, and other hallucinogens for anyone who's 21 years old or older. So um, it also allows their records to be dismissed or expunged if they uh, once it's passed for prior use and um, it, it's it's wrong on so many levels mm. to create this you know we already have problems with drunk driving and now mm. mar uh, marijuana and then this would add lsd and hallucinogens to this and uh, to have personal use and sharing it with your friends. And no, no, I mean, it, it's a pretty simple no. And to my, to my view, yeah. um, to ask your state Senator to say it and to say, this is just not a good idea. We don't need more drugs. Just, just yeah. say no to SB 519. <laughs> my goodness, my goodness. You know, <laughs> where is common mm -hmm. sense? You know, I, I would, people get elected to office and I don't, you know, it doesn't matter what you're, whether you're Democrat or Republican or whatever, to even consider passing something like this is, you know, it's, it's beyond conscious, you know, to think. Well, part of the problem, Dolores, is that we have a full-time legislature. Yeah. They're, yeah. In, they're in that capital 
every year for this is a, yeah. the first year of a two year mm -hmm. session. About 2,500 bills were introduced in January. There will be another 2,500 next oh, January. And so it goes. Um, to, it would be wonderful to my mind if, there, if they were allowed fewer bills. We don't need so many. And you don't have to introduce 20 bills if you're given tw the ability to introduce 20 bills. Yeah. Maybe we start repealing some of the bills that are on the books and um, do a little bit less of it but a, a part-time legislature would be helpful because then our yeah. lawmakers may need to go have another job and learn what it's like <laughs> to have a business to run a business yeah. and to have to deal with taxes and everything else but um it it, it it's almost uh, as though they're a little bit too much time on their hands and a lot of a lot of voices encouraging them to um, produce these pieces of legislation. Um, yeah. Lots of special interest groups um, encouraging it, sponsoring these bills, and uh, it would be nice to, to dial that back and have fewer, um, but that's a major change for, that would be a major change for California. Oh, well, yeah, and, and you know, and it's, it's very expensive also um, to produce each one of those bills as well, yeah. right? Everyone costs the taxpayers. Years ago, I heard the estimate at about $20,000 it cost yeah. just to run the bill through the whole process, legislative council and through the committee process and all that. It's probably more than that now, but just think of all the hands that have to touch this bill and determine what the language should be and where it needs to go and the committees it's supposed to go to and all of that. So it's a very yeah. costly process. Yeah, I got more ways than one. And we're paying for it. It's yeah. But you know, when things don't come out of your directly out of your, your uh, bank account, then you don't mind spending other people's money. <laughs> Apparently, that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, now the next bill, SB 642, that one is about health care and uh, LGB. You know, you expound on that one. Sure, this is a, a, a bill. Um, by a legislator um, who used to be on the assembly side. It started out as an assembly bill, AB 705, and now it's she took a, a Senate spot. There was a change of a, a special election and someone got, uh, someone was uh, appointed to a state office. So now she's on the Senate side and this it's, we would consider it to be kind of an attack on a Catholic hospitals, faith-based hospitals because uh, it would require that they these um, hospitals or the the doctors there um, follow the conscience or religious principles upon which that organization is based in other words a catholic hospital in general would not perform abortions would not have assisted suicide on its campus, would not do gender transition surgeries, um, but this would remove the ability to say no to that. It would prohibit them from refusing this type of care in their facility. So again, it's, it's a freedom and a conscience issue on behalf of these um, corporations. And um, it's already passed its policy, it went to Judiciary and Senate, it went to the Health Committee and Senate, and it's in appropriations. And so there's been a lot of, uh, quite an outcry, you know, from the um, faith-based communities that have these healthcare facilities. And so, th so that they wouldn't be forced to allow doctors to perform these things under their roof. Yeah, that's just pure evil. I'm sorry, I, I you know, what did God say? You got to call evil evil and call it out for what it is. And this is just, it seems like there's just an attack on life. Mm -hmm. And, and um, not just California, California kind of leads the way, but it's just an attack on life. Uh, life just, it's just expendable. But there you go with removing God from everything. When you take him out of the culture and out of everything, then that's what he gets replaced with. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So H HR 10, that is another one. This one is uh, about abortion. And so you can share a little bit about that one. 
Sure. Uh, every every year, you know, we just wait for what the number is going to be. Um, every year, the assembly will have a House resolution, and the Senate will have a Senate resolution. Um, touting how wonderful the Roe v. Wade decision was in order to provide access to abortion. Um, it's an annual celebration mm -hmm. of Roe and it gets adopted every year. This time uh, on the assembly side, it was just a voice vote. Mm -hmm. And then on the Senate side, they actually did take a vote. So you can go on the, the state's website and look and see what the actual vote was, how your Senator voted. Um, unfortunately, on the assembly, it was just a, a voice vote, but it, they, it's California. Um, mm -hmm. It's a very blue state and every year these resolutions pass. Yeah. So yeah, it's just an sad. acknowledgement. It, it doesn't have any force of law to it. Yeah. It's just a mm -hmm. rah, rah, row. Yeah. Well, just acknowledge killing babies. <laughs> Basically, right. is what it is. Yeah. Now, uh, there are a couple two year bills that um, and, and I realized that now this was Republican R. Kelly, Kylie, rather, personal freedom. That one, I believe, didn't pass. And then, of course, uh, Jones here in San Diego, the religious freedom. First one was personal freedom, one's religious freedom. Um, can you just speak about those? I know they were two year bills and and, um, yeah, um, if, a, if a bill does not make it through the committee process, we have a two year session mm -hmm. in, um, in California. And so this is the first of that two year session first year. So if a bill doesn't make it through its all of its policy committees in its first house so that it can get down to the floor and through that first house, um, it can be set aside and then brought back by the author the following year. So what happened with AB 327 by um, assembly member, Kevin Kiley, he wanted to prohibit um, any kind of state office, any age, any government agency, um, any, any um, business that has public funding. He wanted to prohibit them from requiring proof of vaccination before you could receive service. So um, it just, it didn't make it through the process. Now, whether that will be a moot point next year or not, I don't know, but it's on the shelf right now and it can be brought back in January um, for another go at it. It just didn't get through. It was a, it had been amended and it just didn't have time to get through the process. Either that or he just pulled it back and thought this isn't the time um, because an author can do that, say, you know what, I don't have all the support that I need. I'm going to wait and do, do this next year. There are quite a few bills actually that are in that situation right now, good and bad. Mm. So um, this is just on hold. We would call it on hold. It's a two-year bill. It's a very short time frame in January that they have to, to get through that first house, um, but then they have normal uh, limits on the rest of the year. So yeah, because bills have to go through two houses to get to the governor for his signature. Mm -hmm. so that's AB 327. The other bill, unfortunately, um, Senator Jones so appreciate his courage in bringing up the religion is essential act. We remember that, that churches were treated differently from other businesses and um, during yes. the, the, the pandemic. Um, now churches are open. Um, there have been, I think, five Supreme Court smackdowns on the, the limits to churches that California had imposed. Um, but this would, going forward, this would have said that the state can't discriminate against churches and treat them differently from other businesses. Um, churches are essential too. We're an essential offering for the public. Um, unfortunately, he did not pass um, his committee hearing. Um, whether he, it, So it failed. We, I believe that it, it's dead at this point, but I'm not positive if he's going to try to bring it back um, next year. Um, but it would, it would make sure that the government can't discriminate against religious organizations um, during any state, if there's a local emergency or a state emergency, um, it would 
require them to look at churches evenly yeah. with other similarly situated businesses. Well, we'll have to pray he brings that one back. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a beautiful bill and it's yes. unfortunate, unfortunate. Mm. Yeah, now those are all the California bills, but I just kind of just wanted to just do a quick talk about HR1 and, and HR5. I, I try to bring those up on a regular basis because so many people just don't know how destructive they are. And I think we need to keep them before people <clears throat> so they understand about HR1 and HR5 and, and, the, and also this attack on the Second Amendment with that uh, HR127, which of course we know that the president had um, gave, wrote an executive order uh, attacking the Second Amendment. But, but, but these are things that you know people need to know about. And I know some here, but I want to make sure here that they know about HR1 and HR5 and how deadly and dangerous they are. Yes. Um, well, HR, they have both passed the House um, yes. and, and now they're in the Senate. And HR1 actually has a, a, num a new number in the Senate. It's S393, but it's still the same bill. You can call it a different name, but it's the same thing. Yeah. And it's the Equality Act. And um, it adds sexual orientation and gender identity to the existing categories for federal anti-discrimination code education, housing, business, employment, all of that. And it, it, it's just a, a diabolical attack on yeah. religious freedom. And it's, a, it's an attack on women more than anybody else. It really is because it will ab you know, blanketly allow uh, gender transition um, biological males who believe that they're females to allow, you know, be participate in women's sports, it will just codify all of this that we see going on. And so it's extremely um, detrimental. Um, National Right to Life even warns about the life part of it. They said that um, it could be used to make abortions more available, expand taxpayer funding of abortion, weaken conscience protections. I mean, there's even a life component to um, to the Equality Act. So um, I think it was um, Matt Staver at Liberty Council, another one of the great legal firms um, defending our rights and freedoms as believers. He called it the biggest threat to religious freedom he's ever seen. That's a big statement. Oh, yeah. That's a big statement. So what mm. we need to pray for, I mean, we still need to call Diane Feinstein and yeah. Alex Padilla, our senators, our federal senators, on both of these bills um, and let them know our opinion. It is not terribly likely to change um, their views, but we still call nonetheless, we pray yeah. for them that their hearts would turn. The Lord can turn the heart of the King. So we yeah. pray that they would do that, that and that we would call, but we pray too for Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema and a couple of the Democrat senators who we understand are going to hold firm on these and not allow this to happen because we have you know we all we need is one or two senators to side with us one really and we can hold we can hold this back we can hold back the tide and so we definitely pray that 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 will happen and some others on the other side would see the threat that this is to to the kids to our kids to our futures it's just it's not right it's not right. And the same, the same goes with um, HR1, the elections. Elections are supposed to be state issue. This, this puts federal control um, to micromanage the election process. And it's, it's unwise, it's unnecessary, it's unconstitutional. And um, it, would, it really interferes with the rights of the states to determine its citizens, the qualifications, eligibility for voters, the process, that's a state issue, not a federal one. So stay out of the state issue, federal government, and it's no on HR1 and no on HR5. Yes. So, but so make the calls. I mean, I, I know we're like, oh, well, they're not gonna listen to me. Just make the calls anyway. Well, you know, every call has an impact. It sure does. It sure does because so, so few people call. Those that do represent a lot more than just their one phone call. Yeah, 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 I agree with that. 
Well, Penny, this has been wonderful. So wonderful Thank to you. have you. And I'm so thankful that you're able to come and, and share your wisdom with, with our people because we certainly need a little more wisdom and a, and a little more common sense uh, well, in society today. Yeah, and, uh, yeah so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, now I wanna, after I introduce uh, or thank my guests uh, who come on every week, I wanna ask you to say a prayer at the end. And also at this time, do you have any information or you, would you like to share how people can contact you or you know, feel free to do that at this time, if anything you wanna say, any final words? I, you know, I would just say the, the bills that we went over are part of a, a list that I put together to help the Judeo-Christian caucus. So if they just look up judeochristiancaucus.com, um, they can find that list of bills and resolutions and go on and find out what the current action item is and have links to look at the language and uh, they can do that there. There are organizations like California Family Council you can follow um, for their information. I don't have a specific personal um, uh, link to send people to for legislation, but we have wonderful at Con you know, Concern Women for America, California Family Council, Capital Resource Institute, Judeo Christian Caucus. There are wonderful groups doing wonderful work throughout the state. And again, those legal organizations, Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, National Center for Law and Policy, Advocates for Faith and Freedom. There are just so many that are doing the good work and we just need to pray for them and support them when we can because they're doing just yeoman's work, so much work that needs to be done and for the minority in, in this state. To, and we have these, we do secure these victories. So I, I just appreciate that. And if they want to look into my picks for San Diego next year, it's a simple email address, pennyspicks at cox.net, P-E-N-N-Y-S picks, P-I-C-K-S at cox.net. I'd be happy to add them as a subscriber. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to thank my audience who come each week and listen to this podcast. And don't forget to subscribe. And I would love to have you be a sponsor to DW's View Stand Up and this and share this message with your friends. Don't just sit on it. Once you listen to it, share it and share it with as many people as, as you can. And I want to thank my sponsor, Kim Yader, and my peak performance coach. I didn't do that at the beginning, but I want to thank Kim and Liam who keep this podcast going. And that's Kim. I want you to know I love you and I thank you for what you do. And dear friends. If we do not stand up for what is right, who will? Who's going to stand if we don't? So please stand. And Penny, please close us in, in a word of prayer. Oh, I will. Thank you so much. Uh, Father God, we just thank you that uh, you are our Father, that you know all that we are going through. Thank you, God, that you just hold us all in the palms of your hand. We ask, God, that you administer to those who serve us in our government, God, that you would just give them um, eyes to deceive the truth, Lord, that you would open their hearts to uh, accept you as their savior, that they might govern righteously and the way that you would, um, that your tenants would become the ones that we follow in our government. I, I pray a blessing over Dolores and all of her work, Lord. And would you undergird those who are just doing so much to support our faith and our freedom in this state and this nation, Lord. We thank you for the victories that we have and we pray for many more. And we do this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.